Thank you so much for those kind words, Margot. I'm deeply honored by this award. Thank you, David Steinberger, Lisa Lucas, and everyone at the National Book Foundation. Your mission to honor books, celebrate the best writing, and expand readership has never been more critical. For my work at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, I wish to salute three distinguished colleagues here. Please wave. Marta Tenda, Chair of the Sloan Board, Adam Falk, President of the Foundation, and Lisa Lynn, Senior Vice President. Uh, when I came to Sloan 23 years ago, we did not support the arts. So without their steadfast commitment to put their money where my mouth was, I wouldn't be here and I couldn't have helped so many talented artists, including 200 book authors, 600 screenwriters and filmmakers, 400 playwrights, and 150 television and radio writers. I'm especially proud of Sloan's support for many works by and about women and underrepresented minorities. 30 years ago, thank you, even before Sloan, I joined the Writer's Room, the nation's first and largest shared writer space, where I wrote my first two books and where I'm now board president. You know, shoestring nonprofit, no one wants the job. So a shout out to Donna Brody, executive director. The room is an affordable sanctuary for any writer open 24 seven and we need more such havens. Since I still write books, I want to recognize my agent, Kathy Robbins, who has perfected the art of rejection with an encouraging smile, my literary lawyer, Michael Rudell, and my editor, Jonathan Karp. I'm lucky to have this A-team. I'm here tonight primarily for supporting exceptional writers like Margot. I wish I could reach each author's name, but it's a long list and they're all my children, so please see our website. I've also supported open access digital libraries and free knowledge. I don't have to remind you that especially today we need to safeguard creative freedom for writers of every stripe and all nonpartisan forms of knowledge. Civilization and culture are not guaranteed. They are relatively recent human constructs and we must defend or lose them. 400 years ago, and I blink, we had a scientific revolution from which we are still reeling. C.P. Snow first warned us about the dangerous loss of a common culture resulting from this split between expert scientists and the rest of us humanists in his 1959 essay, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution. Much of my Sloan work in public understanding of science technology, my support for books along with radio, TV, film, theater, and new media that translate science for the lay public, focuses on bridging these two cultures and finding a common language and a comprehensive vision so they can better understand and relate to one another. The stark triumph of modern science technology is an extraordinary human achievement that have improved the lives of billions of people on Earth and vastly increased our storehouse of knowledge and our capabilities as a species to reshape our planet. It's even allowed us to venture beyond our planet and send a human to the moon a robot to Mars, and a probe into interstellar space. And even beyond space, it's enabled us to peer into the vastness of time, or space-time, and detect the birth pangs of the universe 13.8 billion years ago. Science may be the most powerful source of systematic knowledge and its application ever developed on Earth. We cannot make progress without science, nor can we begin to understand modern life, or the modern world, or any world, or even ourselves, without a rudimentary grasp of science. However, science alone is not enough. First, we need wise policies to ensure this power does more good than harm. Second, that its benefits are distributed equitably. Third, that it improves the human condition as well as human conditions. Further, despite all its impressive advances, science still cannot help the average person lose weight, avoid a cold, prevent wrinkles, get smarter, cure most cancers, predict an aneurysm or stroke, prevent Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, banish addiction and mental health problems, or live past 100. Science cannot yet explain consciousness or even exactly how memory works. It cannot explain artistic creativity or spirituality. It cannot inform you whether or where in the universe extraterrestrial life exists or why the universe exists in the first place. And science cannot tell you how to bring up happy, well-adjusted children and become a better person yourself or what it means to lead a good life. 
So as hugely important and indispensable as science is, it's not sufficient for our development and fulfillment as individuals or as a society. Our innermost feelings and thoughts, our dreams, memories, terrors, passions, and aspirations require more than science and a purely scientific understanding of the world. History, philosophy, literature, art, music, languages, ethics, and religion all play their part in explaining who we are, how we got here, and where we are going. That is why we continue to invite scientists and humanists to engage one another and why we support authors and other artists willing to creatively tackle science technology subjects. At bottom, science and the arts are two sides of the same human impulse to understand and meaningfully describe the world around us and inside us. So please keep sending us your book proposals. I will continue to read each one and to support as many qualified writers as my generous colleagues at Sloan permit. My secret is that I fulfill the dreams of hundreds of writers because I share those dreams. My thanks again to the National Book Foundation for helping me fulfill my dreams, but full disclosure, I'm working on a new novel, so I dream of returning here in a few years from one of these other awards. Meanwhile, I'll keep dreaming and working to help more of you fulfill your dreams while we strive together to repair the world. Thank you.